So I think I was about somewhere around nine years old, and I was at one of those Christmas events where you go to extended family members' homes, and I was given a gift by an aunt that I didn't appreciate at all. And my parents watched me in uh, great anxiety as I unwrapped the gift, wondering if my usual lack of filter would prevail once again. And uh, somehow I found the ability to say thank you and to be polite. I actually don't remember what the gift was. I do remember the conversation my parents had with me on the car on the way home. Uh, they were very proud of me. Uh, aunts aren't always good at buying presents for boys. But she tried, and if nothing else, that could be appreciated. And so that's when I began to think that maybe gratitude is just a form of politeness. A way to respond that's not embarrassing. A way to keep from hurting another person's feelings. I think we're going to discover today that gratitude is far more than politeness. Gratitude is a way of seeing deeper and more. You see, in our life, stuff can make our lives feel cluttered and heavy, but gratitude is what makes our lives feel full. We're going to look at a story, and uh, uh, it's probably the most famous story of all the stories that Jesus told. And uh, so just bear with me because we're going to look at this from the position of gratitude today as opposed to some of the other things that we would talk about. But in Luke, the 15th chapter, Jesus says that there was a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants." So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became, what's the next word? Angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, it's quite a moment when your son finally looks at you and starts a sentence with that word. All these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. 
But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I think there are some telltale signs of grateful people, and one is that grateful people tend to see life as a gift. Lots of people tend to see life as a burden that has to be borne, or a debt that has to be paid, or an obligation that has to be fulfilled. But grateful people, they see something else. They see life as a gift. And this is not God's attempt to call us to some kind of delusional approach to life. He's not telling us to pretend anything. He's telling us to see things that we tend to not notice now. He calls us to see beneath the surface and beyond the horizon, that there is something deeper and further than we realize. And when we do realize it, it brings gratitude into our hearts. Grateful people see value in what other people see as ordinary or even disposable. There's a second tendency of grateful people, and that is they tend to judge others less. They tend to judge others less. We might perceive that others haven't worked quite as hard as we have for what we have obtained. But there is, that is the fundamental issue about gratitude, isn't it? Is that you're never grateful for what you think you deserve. You earned that. Gratitude is only released for things that we think we haven't earned, that we don't deserve. And uh, if if not getting what you think you deserve is troubling, watching someone else get something that you think they don't deserve is even more troubling. The challenge is, is that we often don't realize that even in times when we're struggling, there are other gifts that we are receiving in those seasons. There's a kind of strength and a peace that we learn to navigate with. Something inside of us gets stronger. We learn some, some capacities that we didn't know that we had. And you may never really value them, but I can promise you that the people around you will. Those are really big deals in your life. So today's story is about three people, and two of them are very grateful, and one of them is not. And the first character in our story is a humiliated son. He had gone away, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but he got a welcome that he never expected that he would receive. He'd actually prepared a speech to get him back onto the property of his father's estate. He was not going to defend his behavior. He was just simply going to apologize, and he was going to offer to be a servant. He wasn't asking even to be a family member anymore. What he got was something a lot more extravagant than what he anticipated. So when that young man fell into bed that night, what kind of prayer do you think came to his lips when he started his conversation with God before his eyes closed. How incredibly grateful was he? The second character is a heartbroken father. He's reunited with a son that he feared was dead. Every day he scanned the horizon of his property, hoping that he would see his son return to him. And he experienced all the kind of grief that anyone experiences when you feel like you've lost someone close to you. His heart would be heavy. His days would be hard. His nights would be sleepless. This would be a difficult thing for him to live day after day without his son. And then on that one day, he sees his son walking up the road, tears were streaming down his face. He ran, hugs he was giving freely. He didn't care who was watching. I'm a sucker for those YouTube videos and Facebook videos about people who have served in the military and come home to their family and their friends unexpected. They just show up someplace. Have you ever seen how those people act? It's amazing. They don't care who's watching. They just run. They leap off of the ground. They throw themselves into the arms of the person that they were afraid they would never see again. They bury their head in their shoulder and the tears flow like rivers and their hugs can't be strong enough or long enough. And that's exactly what it was like for this man seeing his son one more time. But there's a third character in the story. And the third character is an angry son. And he's angry at a brother who has returned and his father celebrating for him. There's two reasons to be angry. He came back. That's a problem. Second problem, the father's actually celebrating. He's offended at the presence of someone he thought didn't have the right to be there. The older brother thought that love was earned, that it's a system of weights and measures, that you have to calculate how things are going to happen in life and how you build your relationships. 
So I wonder when that older brother laid down on his bed at the end of the day, I wonder what his prayer sounded like that evening. Or maybe he didn't pray at all. And maybe that's a clue to us. Maybe in seasons of our life where there's an absence of prayer, what it's really about is a lack of gratitude. It has more to do with not appreciating what we have than it is about losing hope that God can answer our prayers. So what are some reasons that we have to be grateful today? And the first I will tell you is this, is that we are forgiven totally. You are forgiven totally. Aren't you glad that when God forgave you of all your faults and failures, he doesn't have a rating system, and, and you had to wait longer to be forgiven than other people? The younger son wanted the inheritance that he would receive when his father died. So think about this conversation. The younger son goes to his father and says, you know, on that day when you're going to die, and then the estate is going to be divided up, and I'm going to get something? And the father says, yes. He says, I'd like you to pretend like that already happened, and I want you to give me my stuff now. How do you think that conversation felt? That's a pretty difficult one for her. So he was, he was guilty of impatience. And then he wanted his inheritance with no strings attached. He didn't want any obligations. He didn't want any responsibilities. He just wanted his stuff, and he wanted to go someplace and do whatever he wanted. That's his independence. And then he squandered his living, the Bible says, on wild living. He's just indulging himself in whatever he wants. So I have a question. Have you ever been impatient? Have you ever strived for independence? Have you ever indulged in something that maybe wasn't the best thing for you or the people around you? You see, we all are guilty we all have fallen short, and we are forgiven totally. There's another reason to be grateful, and that is that you are embraced fully. This is fascinating to me. The son has a prepared speech. He starts to give it, but the father doesn't make his son wallow in guilt and shame before releasing forgiveness. He actually interrupts him. Now, in our culture, that's not uncommon at all. People interrupt each other all the time. In fact, it's hard to finish a sentence. I one time was in a dispute with an individual in which I was trying to complete a sentence, and I counted. I can't help it. I'm a counter. I counted the number of times he interrupted me before I could complete one sentence. Are you ready for the number? You don't want to know? 54. 54 interruptions before I could complete a sentence. Yes. I'm guilty of the sin of counting sins against me. That's what I do. So. When somebody takes a breath, we jump in because we weren't really listening, and we're pretty sure we know what they're going to say. And so we just interrupt. But back in that culture, that was a very uncommon thing to do. But the father interrupts his prepared speech, and he gives him another gift in addition to all the other gifts he's going to get that day. He gives him the gift of his dignity. He's not going to rake him through the mud. He's not going to make him feel even more guilty. He just wants him to feel like a son again. Yeah. You have been restored completely. The father could have called for a servant's tunic and some sleeping quarters where the hired servants would stay, but that's not what he does. He says, bring the best rope. Not just any rope will do it, but the best rope. And bring a ring. A ring isn't just a piece of jewelry. It signified that you were reinstated in the family. Anyone who saw you knew you were back. And put sandals on his feet because barefoot is what people did when they were mourning and they were in grief. But there was no longer any mourning or any grief in this house. He had been restored completely. And then you are celebrated extravagantly. He says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a party, kind of like the Thanksgiving meal you just had last week. And why? Is it because this is a national holiday? No, it's just because you walked in the door. I want you to think about this. The day you turned your heart towards your heavenly father, he ran towards you. He wrapped you up in his arms. He squeezed the life back into you. His tears flowed freely, and he called for the most amazing celebration. And all of heaven rejoiced just because you were there. Grateful people tend to be present. Ungrateful people 
tend to be distant. Ungrateful hearts are always thinking about somewhere else they would rather be or someone else they would rather be with or something else they would rather be doing. The older brother didn't, didn't just come in. He, he refused to walk into the room at all. He stayed outside. And now his father, just like he had searched the horizon of his property every day to see if he could spot his younger son returning, is now searching the horizon of his older son's heart. The older son's heart is blind because that's what ingratitude does to us. It blinds us. It can't see the value of what's right in front of you. He saw this younger son as a threat to his inheritance. He sees his father as guilty of the sin of favoritism. He saw the situation as completely unfair. Here's the thing about ingratitude. It will always provide you a reason not to do the right thing. Because we know what the right thing is. We really do. But then we think of the reason. So the question is, what motivates God in dealing with us? Is he playing favoritism? Does he choose some over others? And the answer is no. It's not favoritism. And it's not some compulsion imposing all of his rules on you so that when you walk in, only the good rule keepers get in and the bad rule keepers are kept out. He's not compulsively trying to control you. He's not trying to prove how powerful he is. If you want to know what motivates God, it is simply this. It is his love. It's his love every single time. And his love is pure. It's never been contaminated by selfishness or greed or desire to dominate anyone or anything. It's just his love. I don't know which is worse. To have nothing in life of value or to have lots of things in life that are valuable and not appreciate them. I think that is a horrible prison to live in, to have all these good things around and not know how to appreciate. So I'm going to make some recommendations, some questions that you can ask yourself every once in a while just to up your gratitude level. All right? And uh, these aren't on the screen, so you can just jot them down. You don't have to remember the whole sentence. Just one word will do. I'll give you the word, and then I'll give you the question. And the word is this. The word is enjoy. What have you enjoyed recently? On Thanksgiving Day, I enjoyed lemon meringue pie. And on Thanksgiving Day, I enjoyed Toll House chocolate chip cookie pie. And I enjoyed the fact that I didn't have to choose between the two. I enjoyed both of them. And I am grateful that when I get home, there is still a little bit of that Toll House cookie pie left. And somebody told me to watch it before I watch the Bills play today because I might not be able to eat it afterwards. <laughs> Enjoy. Secondly, ability. What are you able to do? It's astonishing how much we downplay what we can do and how much we crave what other people can do. But if we took your abilities and gave them to someone else, they would probably be thrilled. What ability do you have you can be grateful for? Third word, provision. What have you received in your life? <laughs> you know, has anybody else watched those shows on television? about the beautiful homes, and they're putting beautiful additions on them, and their addition is bigger than my whole house. Has anybody else watched one of those things? They, they put, a, they put a, a deck and a pool on a house that might not fit in our neighborhood. I'm not sure. It was just unbelievable. And it's so easy to look at that stuff and, and to not appreciate what you have. Do you know how many people in this world would give anything for a warm bed and a roof and food? and clothing. And we just, we're so used to it. God has provided for us. And then the last question, something you've learned. What have you learned? So there's incredible lessons, not just information that we access so that we can pass a test. The things we learn in life. When we do that, our gratitude levels can grow. I'm going to give you one more thing to be grateful for today, a shorter message than usual. 
So if you bow your heads. It really is so easy in our world to get sucked into this idea that we should have more. And it's not wrong to want more. But sometimes, sometimes we don't just want more. We think we can't be happy until we get it. So you have loved ones that you get to hug and talk to. You have a place that you can call home. You have friends. We have a great deal to be thankful for. So, Father, I ask that you would help us not just fill our lives with stuff, but to make our lives seem full because of gratitude. And there's this amazing truth for each and every one of us that it's not more stuff that makes us feel more grateful. That actually, it's often true that those who have less that are grateful all the more. Would you help us be wise today? Expand our capacity for gratitude so that our lives can feel full. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? There's one more thing we'll do this morning. And that is, as we enter into this chorus of praise, praise is a way we express our gratitude to God. So let's take advantage of this opportunity to lift our voice and tell Him for ourselves how much we love His amazing grace. <laughs>